I see you're all here. I see you're all appropriately dressed. You got nice shirts on and nice clothes. But more than that, you got nice smiles, nice greeting. We're going to have nice food, which is a preparation of love. You get a nice word, right? You're dressed properly with clothes of righteousness. Why do we show up every Sunday? Why do you come here every Sunday? Why have you newcomers come? What are you sticking around for, some of you guys who've been here for decades? What do you come to the church for? Are you obligated? You feel like, I better go or I'll miss my face. I'll get a call from the pastor. Or I generally don't do that. You come out of love. You come out of love for Jesus Christ. You have obligated yourself to him. Paul says we have an obligation in the book of Romans. Because he paid for you. You were bought with a price, and you say, okay, I have an obligation to that person, to that, to love that person. Anybody seen the crime rates lately? Some people are dressed with unrighteousness. They say most of the big cities are, the crime rates are up. Some of them way up. The being locked down during COVID didn't help. Now the fuel prices, have you seen Sri Lanka lately? Seen what happened in Japan? It's kind of closing in because we know the devil's schemes. Paul also said we are not unaware of his schemes. You know what his scheme is? To kill you. To kill people. Not so much with a gun. He just wants you to die a slow death of unrighteousness. Like, I think I'll just go away from the house of life and the house of light and be lost in the darkness. But you and I are not unaware of his schemes. We know them. We see it. So the time for us, the occasion for us, your title in your bulletin, is be dressed for the occasion. Your occasion is that you are the bride. You're the church. You've clothed yourself with stuff, with things, with the, with the, with the life that pleases the Lord. Remember when he, uh, the Lord talks about the wedding and uh, the, somebody sh shows up with no wedding clothes on. What happened? Like, get that bum out of here. You know, you're supposed to be dressed properly. We're dressed properly. I'm not talking about t-shirts versus collars. I could care less. You talk to the board about that. I'm talking about righteousness versus unrighteousness. We want to be clothed properly. Romans 13a, owe no one anything except to love each other. We don't, we're not saved by the law. I do want to remind you, because we've been told for centuries, that the law was not grace, it was grace. It is grace. God is t telling us what he demands of us. He says, this is who I am, you can't fellowship with me, you can't live with me unless you look like righteousness. Now the bad news is you can't fulfill, you can't live by the law, so let me become your righteousness. Jesus became your righteousness, so we are clothed with his righteousness. See? The law is not done away with. We fulfill the law by accepting Christ. 
and putting on the clothes of Christ. And that's why I should love you. Forgive me when I don't do that a great job. I need to do better. We all need to do better. The law is actually quite amazing. It reveals the character of God. It reveals who he is and what he demands. But it does reveal that we come short of the glory of God. We can't fulfill it. Thus, Jesus came. Don't try to fulfill the law through the Ten Commandments and actually the 613 laws that the Mishnah had. Right? Don't try that. Just love Jesus. If you love me, he said, you'll keep my commandments. It's amazing that we just kind of do away with the law. We don't want to talk about it anymore. There's very little talk about holiness. Holiness is out of style. Look like Jesus. What would Jesus do? That old bracelet's gone, right? No, we want to dress. We want to dress for the occasion, and the occasion is... Like when we first went through Romans, remember Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3, was that God wants righteousness on the planet. He wants it in the universe. Why? Because he wants everybody to see who he is. He wants everybody to know him. So he says, this is who I am. And so my church has gone out to the other ends of the earth to show my righteousness, to their love for one another, and to reveal who Jesus Christ is. God is doing it for his glory and for your good. For your good. So talk about righteousness and holiness. Put those clothes on. I don't talk that way anymore. I don't tell those stupid jokes. I don't even listen to them. Time out. I'd rather not hear it, please. Oh, who are you? Holier than thou. No, I just, I don't want to offend my Lord. I'm not going to laugh at your jokes. I'm not going to dress like you in unholiness. Uh, we were going through the scripture this morning and just some lovely stuff that Gary's teaching. And I was, as I was reading ahead a little bit, sometimes I do that, Gary, I apologize. But, um, in Genesis 17, when God got done talking to Abraham, what did he do? God went It's like just kind of caught me because of the sermon this morning. God went up from Abraham. Okay, Abraham, you're on your own. <laughs> like, you got it from here, right? With that faith and the promise that he had and a plan for his family and the generations and the Lord had spoke to him and gave him really good news. Fantastic, life-changing news for everybody on the planet if they would listen to the covenant of Abraham between God and Abraham. And God said, okay, but I'll be with you. Don't worry, I'm watching. But he went up. Cut my eye. Jesus went up. Jesus went up on the mountain, per se, right? He went up on the mountain and hung on a cross. He said, I'm going away. And so then when he died, he was back with him for a while. But then what? He went up again. Where are you, Jesus? I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. I will not leave you alone as orphans. The good news. He said those things before he left. He went up. He said, okay, you're the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. Now you're the light of the world. Here's the plan. Go out and make disciples. You're the bride. You're the church. You're the chosen ones. Come together, gather together, work together. Love one another. Jesus went up. And he wrote the perfect law on our hearts. Just kind of like what he did to Abraham. Then who else went up? Remember Moses went up? I want to remind you something. Uh, in fact, I'm going to say this a lot, okay? Because I have been for the last several years. And more and more lately, as I hear people say, unhitched from the Old Testament. 
what would I say to you? Do you know the Old Testament? There is no doubt in my mind that as you read, and if you come to certain law, certain words, your mind should go jumping back to what you prayerfully read in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. On and on. It's on. Right? You read about the law. You read when the law came. You read how Moses went up. Right? He went up to the mountain. It's interesting because when, when Moses went up, it says God came down. And then God went up and then Moses came down. <laughs> Moses is the first prophet. There will be a prophet after you. That's Jesus. But Moses went up to get from God what he needed, the law. Now we say, well, the Ten Commandments, you know. Well, remember what it starts with. You shall love the Lord to God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You will have no other God before me. Don't use his name in vain. And then all these other things, honor your father and mother, don't commit adultery, all those kind of things, which Jesus said, you know, one up, let's, don't even commit adultery, don't even lust. Don't, you know, I'm not talking about murder, don't even hate. So he like one-upped us, you know. You can do it, because my spirit lives in you, Jesus said. But when the law first came down, Moses went up to get it, and it came down. Now, when Moses went up, like Jesus went up, like the Father went up, right? When Moses went up, what did the people do? Like, when God went up, Abraham, you know, he had already kind of messed up with Ishmael, and then, you know, there's a couple other issues with Abraham, but, you know, Abraham basically lived a good life, and then Isaac, and then, you know, Jacob had some issues, you know, and, and on, but God went up, so people are kind of like, okay, what do I do now? Jesus went up, but what did the disciples do? Well, I better get on what Jesus said to do, right? Get on with it. When Moses went up, What'd they do? Did they get on with business? It says he stayed a long time. <laughs> kind of like Jesus, like 2,000 years. A long time. Jesus said when he went away, you know, he talked about the virgins, the ten virgins, keep watch. He talked uh, about uh, Matthew 25, verse 14. Like a man who went on a journey, he gave some things to the, par the, the, the stewards to take care of until he, you know, until he came back while he was gone. In Luke 19, it says he entrusted his property with his servants. Th that's you, by the way. You're entrusted with the property. I'm not talking about 708 East 19. I'm talking about the word of God. The love. For the church, the work in the church. You're entrusted with this property. And then in the parable, Jesus said this after a long time. The guy was a long time. Well, Moses was up on the mountain a long time. You remember what the people did? They kind of got antsy. Like, where's Moses? What's he doing up there for 30 days and then 35 days, whatever it was? By the time they got antsy, he was up there 40 days, we know that. And then Exodus 32, it says, when the people saw that Moses delayed, like, <laughs> like what, is he having lunch or something? He didn't eat for 40 days. He's not delaying. The people are going, you know, hey, he's taking his sweet time here. When he delayed to come down the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, what? Up, arise, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what he has become of him. So Aaron said to them, isn't it interesting? It's like Moses went up to see God, but we don't know what's happened to him. Maybe he's dead up there? Like what, he's not in good hands? Come on, guys. Is Jesus in good hands? Okay, let's settle that, right? 
He's not delaying like, uh, boy, I don't know what he's doing up there. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives. How about you wives? Like, would you give up your gold? Are you here, husband? Take my gold. And your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it. Watch the words here. He fashioned it. That took time. He molded it and fashioned a calf. With a graving tool. And made a golden calf and then said, now this is Aaron, right? Listen, folks. That, that would be like Gary It saying, hey, Gary, you know, make us a calf. Or Dan Crick, you know, president of the board. Pastor Raymond or somebody saying, hey, give me your stuff. I'll make a calf for you. Come on, Aaron. He says, to, Aaron says, these are your gods, O oh, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, the book, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to rest, to eat and drink, and rose up to play. This is like the church being told to go about business and saying, I think we should forget business. Let's call out to another God because you ain't calling out to Yahweh. You think you may be. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you, watch, watch what the Lord says, whom you brought up <laughs> out of the land of Egypt. Have, can, I can't help to laugh there. Like the Lord said, you brought them up. Later on, watch, watch, I'll, I'll get there. Whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside from the commands. My wrath may burn hot against them. I'm going to consume them. And then in verse 11, watch. But Moses said, oh, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against the people whom you brought up? <laughs> have you ever argued with God? Like, I didn't do this. This is not my fault. This is yours. And God's saying, no, it's yours. It's yours. Actually, the Lord sometimes brings things about. He makes things happen. He tests us. He doesn't tempt us. And then he says, this is your fault. And then you say, Look, and then you say Lord, this is kind of your fault. So he said... Uh, Moses said, you brought them up by the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them up? And in other words, Moses said, listen, don't kill them because they're not going to blame you for bringing them up and then to killing them. You know? So the Lord relented and Moses went down. You remember the story? <laughs> Moses went down. He heard the sound of singing. He saw the calf. He saw the dancing. He threw the tablets to the ground. And they busted. And then he ground that calf into powder and made them drink it. What happened? They wasted their time. They wasted their time. Why didn't they build an altar to the Lord and have weekly communion or even daily? Gather around together. Let's go over what Moses has taught us since we came out up out of Egypt. Let's go over these things. Let's gather the elders and the teachers and let's gather them. And mothers, then take them, get the kids into the tents and, and let's raise godly families and let's do these things. And they didn't do that. They rose up to play. They rose up to play. Because Moses delayed coming down. Jesus is kind of delaying coming down. He's delaying a long time. Besides this, you know the time, the occasion. 
You know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. Your evil day is almost over. Don't quit. I, I, almost, I almost said, you know, the title, the first title to this was in view of the, the, the finish line. It's like you see the finish line right in front of you, and you, and you say, well, I think I'll pull over and have lunch. I think I'm just going to take it easy. It's like, yeah, I've been running the, the 350 meters for way too, you know, I did really good, and I'm out ahead. I think I'll slow down. Why would you do that? I see the finish line. I am going to go faster. I'm going to run faster. <clears throat> Why would I slow down? Like Moses, Jesus went up on the mountain, as it were. He talks about several parables about waiting for the master. He warned the Pharisees. He warned. See, the Pharisees are in charge of things. And he's going to warn his disciples about the same thing. Don't, don't be like them who have given up the, the word of God and the work of God and the love of God and the work on behalf of people he loves. Let's just pull over and have lunch. He warned about falling away into drunkenness and carousing. Because 1 Corinthians 7, Paul emphasizes this what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is the time is short. So you got to be dressed for the time. I see the Lord coming. Anybody see the Lord coming? Anybody see the disaster on the earth and we think, okay, now wait a minute, one of two things is happening. Things are falling apart or things are falling into place. Things are falling apart. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. Things are falling into place. Jesus is close. Hey, you've been saying that for 2,000 years. Paul said that. Paul's saying it now. Time is short. But look, we're 2,000 years down the road. And by the way, Israel's in the land, right? And this, you know, one world government globalist issue is happening in the West over there and Magog and God, the foundation of all that is happening. Talk to me about that later. It's staring us right in the face. It's as clear as a bell. Crime rates are up. Church numbers are down. People are looking for a place. Talk to Joel. Talk to people who are looking for a place because there's very few of them. There are fewer of them that teaches it from Genesis to Revelation. The time is short. Here's some quotes here. It's a strange thing, but when you are dreading something and would give anything to slow down time, it has a, a disobliging habit of speeding up. Either you run the day or the day runs you. The key is not spending time, but investing it. There's not enough time to do all the nothing you want. Time is free, but it's priceless. Once you've lost it, you can't never get it back. Can't never get it back. I read that one, okay. Here's, here's from Dr. Seuss. We like Dr. Seuss. How did it get so late so soon? It's night before it's afternoon. December is here before it's June. My goodness. How the time has flown. How did it get so late so soon? Uh, do you remember when you were 12? 15? 18? Got married? Had your first child? Got your first job? Celebrated your retirement? Twice? <laughs> time has flown. It's gone. We're a vapor, young, young, young people, take note. Mrs. Bergerson in the, I think it was the sixth grade, 
or seventh, seventh grade. I remember her standing up saying, you young kids, you just don't know how, time, how much, how fast time goes. And I'm sitting here making my spit wads, <laughs> thinking, this lady's nuts. How do you spend your time? It's okay to relax. I'm going to the beach here in another week and a half or two, okay? My wife's out there, she beat me to it. I'm not talking about VBS either. I'm going to a real beach. It's, it's okay. You need to take vacation. You need to go. You need to relax. But your life is not relaxing. Your life is love and work. You are dressed with righteousness. I'm going to do what's right even when I'm sitting on the beach. Matthew 16, 3, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Luke 12, 56 says, you, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky. I thought that was interesting. The appearance of the earth. Anybody know the appearance of the earth right now in the sky? You can look around, you know. I would, I'm not going to read 2 Peter 3. You should read 2 Peter 3, 1 through 13. It talks about the, the times, and God is patient. He's not slack. He is coming. And then he says, don't get caught up in the times. I would even paraphrase, get dressed for the occasion. Time is short, he says. Don't go around carousing. Don't be like the Israelites. So the number one thing that the Israelites were doing down below the mountain was they were wasting time, and then the, and the, and the second thing was they weren't looking out for the enemy. They, they had enemies in the camp. And by the way, Satan, like I said before, Satan is out to kill everybody. It's called through, you know how he does it? It's called through the deception of sin. It's okay to do this. It's okay. Either God has forgiven you or he's not watching you or... You know, you're only human. It's okay. So back to Exodus 32. And, and Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? Wow. Aaron was the enemy. The priest. The prophet, if you will. Was the enemy. He was supposed to be the mouthpiece for Moses. He became the enemy. Uh, you know why? Because he was afraid of the people. He like listened to the people's voice. Like Adam did. And Abraham did. And others listened to other people's voices. And think I'm going to take it upon myself. And I'm going to do this my way. He didn't, they didn't wait. They were son of impatience. We talked about this morning. Abraham. Got to have that baby now. Uh, you know, I'm a hundred, almost a hundred. <coughs> and so, um, and, then, and then watch what Aaron says. And Aaron said, let not the anger of the Lord burn hot. You know the people. They are set on evil. <sighs> okay, Aaron, how about you? But, and, and for they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. And for this Moses, the man who brought us up, from out of the land of Egypt, we do not know where he has, what has become of him. So I said to them, let any of you have gold, take it off. So they gave it to me. And I, now watch. Watch. This is Aaron. This is the high priest. This is the guy who's the head of the priesthood. Watch what he says. So they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. That guy's lost his mind. See, that's what sin does. He's afraid. Now he's afraid of God. Now he's afraid of Moses. He was afraid of the people. Listen, folks. I'm going to tell you right now. In this day of age, we brave it. We have to be courageous. This is an age that the church must be brave as we dwindle down and head into this darkness of darkness, remember just before the dawn. 
You have to be brave now. Young people, be brave now. I'm not taking that. I'm not drinking that. I'm not sleeping with you. I'm not going home with you. I'm not doing that because I love my God. And I'm going to meet him someday. I'm going to, I'm going to stare him in the face probably after I stare at his feet. He's going to raise me up. He's going to wipe away my tears. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in. Can you not wait? If you're 7 or 8 or 12 or 15, you can wait. Trust me, because I did. Not very good sometimes. And then I talk to the 90-year-olds, and they tell me, you, they're showing me, actually, you can wait. Because they did it. Out came this calf. When Moses saw that, watch what Moses, watch this line. When Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies. What does it mean to break loose? Some of your texts are going to say they got naked and danced. You know, it doesn't matter what happened. They went south and they went hard and they were in sin and debauchery. Proverbs 29, 18, when there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off the restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Isn't that cool? Like, wait a minute, I don't keep the law. Yes, you do. Do you love your neighbor? Do you love God? I'm not going to hurt him. I'm not going to hurt her. I'm not going to do that. I love my God. I love these people. I want to go in on Sunday morning worshiping with everybody, in fact, leading them. Hugging them. Come on to the Lord. We're going to worship together. We're going to dance together. And we're not going to be naked when we do it. Come on together. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now listen, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of us are going to go out and do some of these weird things, right? I, like, you know, it's just not probably going to happen. But first of all, that's the first warning. Because that's where Satan wants to take you. He wants to kill you. But let's talk about jealousy. Let's talk about anger. Let's talk about gossip. Do you talk about other people behind their backs? Do you malign them? Do you hate people? Do you drink too much? Do you look at pornography? The killer of the church, by the way. If you do, stop. Throw the computer in the river. It's a killer. It's a deceiver. How bad is it out there? Well, how bad do you want it to get? How bad do you want to see it? What's the bad news? These are two lovely people. They're Christians. They belong to a church. The journalist, the editor here or whatever, is taking a picture of them naked sitting on their porch. Now they have something in front of them for the camera, but they are naked. And they are Christians. It's one thing to be with Christians in a building. Chip says. It's another thing to be with Christians who are nudists. There's a deeper connectivity. Though nature's resort is not explicitly religious, it is affiliated with American Association for Nude Recreation, an organization with deep Christian roots. What does Christian mean anymore? What does evangelical mean anymore? What does the church 
look like anymore. It's kind of frightening. He goes on to say, the writer here, or some of the people being um, interviewed, God's dress code from the beginning has been to cover our nakedness with his righteousness, is what he's saying. Even still, nudism attracts unlikely uh, allies. Some non-denominational hardline conservative clergy even accept nudism, which I want to talk to those guys, right? But they did talk to one, and they give some examples. This guy's real conservative, but he doesn't see anything wrong with this. Well, that's just nature. That's the way God made them. We got to remember something. Genesis 3:20. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothes. <laughs> like, no, you're not going around naked on my watch, God said. Adam didn't even ask him. God made him garments. Get dressed. The, the people say, I, I think it's odd. I think it's strange, but I have no proof it's sinning. We have a retired couple that sit in front of the front row every Sunday that live as a, at a nudist camp. I believe they're dedicated Christians because the Bible doesn't explicitly forbid nudism. Smith says he cannot condemn them. Revelation 16, 15, let's talk about the righteousness aspect, the spiritual aspect of being clothed. Be, behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on. That's the close of righteousness. I'm going to do the right thing. That he may not go around naked and be exposed. In Isaiah 61, 9, their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I will rejoice greatly to the Lord. My soul will extol my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and wrapped me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom wears a priestly headdress as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Adam and Eve found out that they were physically naked and they needed clothes. The shame of the Old Testament for the enemy was to disclose their enemy, their slaves, to unclothe them. We are to go around clothed, both physically and spiritually. 1 Timothy 6, 8, we will be content with food and clothing. I don't really need to beat this drum, do I? That's just common sense. But see, this is the point. If that's common sense, and it has gotten into the church, that it no longer makes sense, folks, you have a work to do. You and I have a work to do. See to it, brothers, that none of you have a wicked heart of unbelief that turns away from the living God. But exhort one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end and assurance we had at first. Sin deceives us. How do you get undeceived? Keep coming to church. Keep learning. Read your Bible. Genesis to Revelation. Where do I start? Pick a book. So, you know, Peter goes back into that, and there's so much in Peter we could have said. The point is this. It's a... Uh, it's a time to be dressed. Amy Grant has an album out long ago called Age to Age. Listen to her words. I got a ticket from I got a ticket from a cop coming home today. Wish the officer had known what a day it has been. Then I stumbled through the door, dropping junk mail on the floor. When will this day end? Our day, our life kind of. Then your letter caught my eye, your letter caught my eye, brought hope into my life. Because you know me very well, and I bet you wrote me just to tell. Boy, that letter hit the spot, made me think of all I've got and all that waits for me. Guess I've known it all day long. Wonder where my thoughts went wrong. 
when will my heart believe? Walking halfway through the night, reaching toward the lamp for light, pick, picking up the word I find, here's another letter to remind me. Days like these are just a test of our will. Will we walk or will we fall? Well, I can almost see the top of the hill and I believe it's worth it all. In a little while, we'll be with the Father. In a little while, he says, just, we're just here to learn to love him. We'll be home in just a little while. So called uh, this morning, we went through another lesson age to age. Jesus is wrapping up this age. In this age of darkness, we need to be clothed with light, the light of righteousness, the light to love your neighbor as yourself, take care of yourself, and love your God. Let's stand and sing this closing word. If you've never been born again, it's as simple as can be. Know that we're a sinner. Know that we need Jesus Christ, that his payment on the cross was, it didn't just cover your sins, it wiped them out. The Father says he remembers your sins no more if you have his Son written on your heart. Behold the man upon a cross. My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath had brought me life I know that it is finished. Thank you, Father, for the plan from age to age, from the plan, for the plan from ages past to the one that is staring us in the face. Sometimes we just can't wait. Thank you for that hope. Thank you for that excitement to know that we will be with you one day. But until then, we need your help, Holy Spirit. We need the courage that comes from the Word of God. We need the power that comes from you alone to endure what is before us. We love you, we worship you, and we praise you for it in Jesus' holy name. Amen.